In this video, I present implementing Ontario's learning outcomes model in the humanities. This is a replica of the presentation I gave of my final oral exam on May 4th, 2022. This video provides a high level summary of my thesis presentation. Before we begin, I acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, I present a summary of my thesis using the same order of content in my written copy, which is to be published in November 2022. I decided to study learning outcomes because I've completed two government-funded appointments where I witnessed the ways in which curriculum was being managed by peering at the learning outcomes in programs and courses. Once the learning outcomes were set up, administrators began to view learning outcomes as handles for managing the curriculum from above. In my search for policy alternatives, I began using the capability approach for my teaching and research. In this picture, one of my students used the capability approach to frame and understand her work as she taught English to temporary foreign workers in Leamington, Ontario, Canada. While my student could have focused her teaching on work terminology, she developed a curriculum that enabled her students to think critically about their experiences within the community and with their employers. In short, skills are not enough in local global economies. Wheelahan says that theoretical knowledge provides access to society's conversation about itself. This conversation includes debates about how society should respond to perceived threats, such as global warming, but also debates about society's values, norms, mores, and questions. Since the humanities are often viewed as theoretical rather than practical, I want to situate the context of the humanities in this discussion. To complete the study, I needed a normative vision for the humanities curriculum. For this, I used the capability approach, Bernstein's pedagogic device, and Wheelahan and Moody's writings on knowledge in tertiary and vocational systems. The process allowed me to frame the political context, the economic challenges, and the public and normative discourses for disciplines in the humanities. The research question for this project is, how do Ontario University leaders in the humanities perceive and implement the shift to the learning outcomes model? In this thesis, the LOM is defined as only one tool among a suite of curriculum management tools that aim to form a market where individuals invest, educational institutions sell, and employers buy. As such, the LOM aims to align microcurricular activities with macro public interests and government incentives in the higher education market. The concept of learning outcomes are often presented as a pedagogical innovation. Learning outcomes were mandated to Ontario colleges and are now working through all levels of tertiary education in Ontario. Since universities are autonomous, Implementing learning outcomes is incremental and involves intra- and inter-university persuasions. The above frameworks proposes the LOM as a pedagogical innovation that translates to all levels of the system and then can be used as a management tool to facilitate trade with external stakeholders. This research sought to describe the implementation of the LOM through the gaze of leaders in the humanities. Specifically, I learned about their perceptions how they navigated policy levers, and why they completed the tasks of the LOM. The implementation of the LOM is highly contextualized. For example, in social work, they have implemented learning outcomes for the purposes of program accreditation, whereas in history or philosophy, there are no connecting professional associations or designations from which to tune their program. Conversion opportunities of the LOM also vary. This study found that it is easier to apply learning outcomes that, in quotations, matter for the LOM in settings that have proximity to the market, professional affiliations, and administrative resources. I reviewed the higher education literature to understand the shifting logics of the institution of a university. The logic has shifted from educating a democratic citizen to the training of an economic citizen. This chart illustrates how there was a gradual shift from democratic citizenship to economic citizenship shortly after the Second World War. The idea of human capital theory began as a description during this period. 
As higher education grew in the 80s and 90s, human capital discourse became normative. By the 2000s, Ontario's high participation system and human capital theory became prescriptive. This gradual shift demonstrates how system architects can appropriate learning outcomes as handles for managing the curriculum. Ontario's strategic mandate agreements demonstrates the shift to prescription whereby economic goals of institutions, such as employment rates, economic impact, research funding, and more, will determine 60% of institutional funding. In Ontario, the notion of accountability began with graduate programs in the late 60s, Notions of quality assurance became much more pervasive in 2005 with a top-down instantiation of bureaucratic accountability projects. The process has been gradual, but the push for systemic learning outcomes is now near completion and connect with performance-based funding. In my research, I use new institutionalism to analyze the iterative politics during the implementation of the LOM. Lowndes and Roberts describe institutions as a form of social organization that refer to social phenomena at varying levels, including informal codes of conduct, written contracts, and complex organizations. Next, I present three figures related to the new institutionalism framework. First, I analyze the gradual institutional change within the political economy of Ontario's higher education system. I also provided a snapshot of the institution of the university. In the middle of this figure, I align department heads within the humanities as change agents in the system. Department heads are at the nexus of information for program reviews, teaching on the ground, and operationalize, or not, the desires of senior administration. Second, I use Streak and Thelen's framework for rule takers and rule makers to analyze gaps between the intentions of policy makers and the actions of those required to implement the policies. They argue that the gap between intentions and actions is a space where agency can occur between rule makers and rule takers. Gaps provide space for change agents, who are also rule takers in this context, to reinterpret the rules in creative ways through their strategies of implementation. For example, rule takers in this research, department heads, may have limited understanding of the policy, they may disagree with the policy, or may explicitly reinterpret the policy to suit their needs, but not the goals set out by the rule makers. I also look to Mahoney and Thelen's modes of change. They share four modes of change. First, layering, is the introduction of new rules on top of or alongside existing ones. Second, drift, is the changed impact of existing rules due to the shifts in the environment. Third, Displacement is the removal of existing rules and the introduction of new ones. And finally, conversion, the changed enactment of existing rules due to their strategic redeployment. I omitted the concept of conversion because I couldn't connect the concepts with the findings. Mahoney and Thelen suggest that drift and layering are the most promising strategies for change in a system with strong veto players. These two strategies suit universities because they have organized labor. In the next section, I discuss the research methodology. This research used a critical realist worldview to acknowledge that while agents construct their own realities, they must constantly navigate dynamic constraints pressed upon them. To follow this worldview, I look to enact models of research that were fit for purpose. First, the development of public policy has become more critical to the success of academic disciplines and institutions. The Seine Bourdieu analytical framework demonstrates the ways in which a person's context and habitus influences what they might have reason to value and how that may translate into economic, social, cultural, and symbolic capital. Second, I admit that the context of the study is partial and historically situated. Third, Bruner's narrative construction of reality helped me to understand the cultural toolkits of the participants within the study. I recruited 19 participants from 10 Ontario universities who worked within the humanities. There were a few department heads from psychology and sociology because their departments resided within the same faculties as their humanities colleagues. I analyzed the data using three strategies. First, I completed a positional analysis within each interview. Second, I conducted thematic analysis. Third, I summarized responses by individual question. All interviews were transcribed verbatim and participants had the opportunity to review their transcripts. In the next section, I discuss the findings. 
First, I discussed the three main positional attitudes of the participants. They were pedagogical hedges, burdensome checkboxes, and other systems. First, pedagogical hedges was defined as having a positive position towards learning outcomes with hedges or caveats. For example, if the development of learning outcomes were organic and used as a pedagogical reflection, then participants had a positive attitude toward the idea of learning outcomes. Two examples included, they're a useful tool, but some of it is a bit pie in the sky. Don't seem to have, frankly, a lot of value on the ground, even though theoretically, I think they could be more useful. Second, burdensome checkboxes was defined by occupational hazards of completing tasks that interfered with the competing priorities, or worse, the task was designed to cut resources to the department by restructuring the curriculum. One department head, new to their position, described their time in a learning outcomes workshop in saying, it was awful. Well, another said, the further up the chain we went, the more ridiculous it became. The participants with LOM experience in other systems used four types of negative language. First, vulgarity. One participant opened with conversations about that shit. Second, physical and emotional assault. One participant remembered the LOM having a sort of billy club quality. Third, political destitution terms like Stalinist or commit a genocide. Fourth, accusatory terms. One called it fraud or a nefarious tool of the neoliberal elite. Proving the efficacy of learning outcomes tended to be more favorable for participants that could prove positive financial outcomes in numbers rather than narratives. One of the humanities department heads from a research-intensive institution in a large metropolitan center said their department was flourishing with new enrollment growth, new faculty hires, and a lucrative area of research. In this case, proving curriculum outcomes for performance-based funding was not a concern. Conversely, others felt a lack of affiliation when thinking about how the learning outcomes model could assist them for proof positive performance. One department had shared that we are orphans when they discuss their relative opportunities for lucrative partnerships and affiliations on campus or in the community. Several participants lamented the task of quality assurance reviews and learning outcomes model demands. At least one of the department heads openly shared the personal struggles they had in managing the department and the neoliberal reforms at their institution. The department had resigned from their position due to reasons of poor health, while another department had recounted their experiences with the learning outcomes model as something that helped them to restructure departments to reduce resources and make the faculty more efficient. Course learning outcomes are typically tied to degree level expectations, which have alignments with educating the democratic citizen. However, the financial investment in the outcomes that were central to the humanities, such as critical thinking, do not often translate into resources and opportunities. The only time critical thinking seemed to be relevant for funding was if it was connected to applied disciplines and if it could bolster enrollment on those terms. Another strategy to bolster enrollment was to allow students to pick multiple areas of concentration through interdisciplinary programs or through double majors. But selling the humanities curriculum as a financial return on investment or within ranking systems proved difficult. Many participants shared that there were no resources, time, systems, money, and desire to pay for the mechanisms to track the activities. Although a few suggested that trusting faculty assessments was far more efficient than hiring external companies to track things they are not qualified to vet. In short, there were many challenges in developing new opportunities for curricular innovation that added new knowledge to disciplines and departments located in smaller city centers. According to Unterhalter, there are two reasons for assessing education, reasons of state and reasons of education. When I pressed participants about why they implemented the learning outcomes model, it was generally to satisfy quality assurance, public accountability, and regulatory frameworks imposed from outside the university. Although many noted that most students and many faculty don't really look at the learning outcomes or care about them. Those promoting pedagogical opportunities for the LOM often lamented the challenges for departmental buy-in among senior faculty and getting them to use the LOM as a daily practice. However, some mentioned that learning outcomes could be helpful for understanding course sequencing, orienting new and sessional faculty, and handling student complaints about professors' pedagogical practices. Significant changes in institutions can often be gradual and incremental. 
In this case, as seen in the dark blue boxes on the left, the political economy of Ontario's government seeks return on investment and persuades universities to buy the rights for training economic citizens. Next, department heads in light grey, described here as time poor faculty, passive compliant administrators, orphans looking for space in the market, or conversely as networkers, and the neoliberal man tuning departments for government incentives while enjoying promotions to senior leadership. The black boxes articulate the main sequential modes of change, beginning with higher education activities tuned to the new administrative layer of a high participation system at universities, whereupon orphaned and non-collaborative departments drift by missing incentivized funding opportunities, passively completing reviews, only to be displaced by curriculum predominantly rationalized on markets. The shift is an imperialization of the Ontario's higher education system. The rule takers and rule makers model demonstrates the shifting position of teaching centers, department heads, and senior managers at institutions. For example, those working to navigate new government mandates could shift from being rule takers to rule makers. One department head said that senior managers were dreaming up courses despite having no academic or disciplinary experience in that particular discipline. In another example, a participant with learning outcomes model experience in the U.S. had proposed a proactive approach saying, if we're out ahead of this curve, if we are one of the leaders in this, they can't possibly cut us, which was true until they cut us. I argue that some of the challenges for funding and well-being in the humanities could be curtailed by repositioning the stakeholder gaze on the terms of human development as a proxy for success. The capability approach is an international movement which demonstrates that economic wealth is not a pure measurable proxy for well-being. Tuning curriculum on a human experience would capture better working conditions for faculty, students, and staff. Nussbaum argued that the humanities and the arts are being cut away in both primary, secondary, and college, university education, and virtually every nation of the world. Tuning an entire system to a market orientation continues to have deleterious effects on the human experience in higher education. As such, this research problematizes human capital theory to solve society's most difficult challenges such as climate change and belonging, equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. In the final section, I share some of the conclusions and implications of the study. This research adds a new view of how curriculum management on the terms of human capital impacts the curriculum and resources in the humanities. The study also provides humanities leaders alternative positional statements focusing on human development, which still includes economic opportunities for students, faculty, and staff, but repositions human capital theory as a means rather than an end. The above photo is my former music school being torn down. Across the street resides a new panopticon-like glass building that houses recruitment, public affairs, and alumni offices. The new music school shares a stunning building in downtown Windsor with three other departments. Music is now alongside several other departments within a heavily departmentalized faculty. Departments in the humanities are drifting further from the dean's office, further from development opportunities, and further from recruitment initiatives. Branding, recruiting, and development continue to expand financially, while the humanities curriculum is parsed, subordinated, and shifted to challenging neoliberal competitions. This research demonstrates the critical role department heads play as change agents in the system. Perhaps these change agents need to look for centers of collaboration that help them focus on human flourishing on the terms of their disciplines. Additionally, humanities leaders must be ready to play the game in preparation for performance-based funding. The study illuminates managerial classifications of disciplines on the terms of human capital theory. It also allows department heads to review various managerial contexts from which other people in the humanities are working. The narratives of the learning outcomes model demonstrates how knowledge is recontextualized into the curriculum, classified, and then placed into a neoliberal hierarchy of funding priorities. It provides situated cultural toolkits that informs department heads who may take their turn at the helm. I am excited to conduct further research as I delve deeper into the purely human experiences of the higher education system. I have opportunities as an administrator, as an instructor, and as a researcher to mobilize a praxis vision for higher education envisioned through human development frameworks. 
I am eager to provide alternatives for developing curriculum within the humanities where students, faculty, and staff can flourish.